Welcome everyone to the webinar for Gustafson School of Business Uncharted webinar series. Welcome Dr. David Den. Well, welcome everybody. Um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to do this. It's, it's wonderful to see some, um, some old friends on the, on the list and it's also wonderful to, uh, to see some, uh, some new friends. Um, my name is David Dunn, for those of you who don't know me. I'm a professor here at uh, uh, Gustafson School of Management at the University of Victoria and um, also director of the MBA uh, program. I have a pretty extensive background in industry in, in marketing with, uh, with uh, Unilever and also uh, have been a, a professor uh, before I was at, uh, at UVic, I was at the Rotman School in, in Toronto. Um, and the reason I mentioned that is that it was at the Rotman School that I started to have an interest in design and what it meant for business and also on a much bigger scale for social problems. Um, this fall, uh, we will be launching the new uh, UVic MBA in Sustainable Innovation and the, the, what I'm about to talk about is very much tied in with that. We have a course on, on innovation and design in the MBA program and there's a huge emphasis on sustainability within the, within the program. So I'm going to um, start in, in that vein by entering, introducing you to a wicked problem. Now, you may think we've got enough wicked problems going on right now. Here's one that you may have heard about in the news if you haven't been totally focused on the current uh, crisis. And it's our good friend, the um, what is popularly known as the murder hornet. Now, the the murder hornet, um, or more formally, the, uh, the Asian giant hornet, um, arrived in the, on the west coast of Canada and the US last year. It is on Vancouver Island, among other places. Um, and it is, uh, it is, its main skill or its superpower, if you like, is destroying bee colonies. So what they do is they will attack uh, bee colonies and in a matter of hours they'll completely decimate them by beheading all the bees and then taking the carcasses back to feed their young. Uh, they're not particularly dangerous to humans though if they attack en masse they are quite dangerous but it's mostly their effect on bees that's been an issue for concern because bees as you, I'm sure you know are absolutely critical to our food supply and so anything that's a threat to bees is actually a threat to us. Uh, what is interesting and what makes it an interesting wicked problem is how they got here. They didn't fly here. Uh, most likely they came on shipping containers. So they're, if you like, a product of the global food supply chain or the global supply chain. And of course, they may indeed affect our food uh, supply chain. And, and the reason I mentioned that is that as a result of the COVID crisis, and this is the theme of the presentation, everything, including the global supply chain and globalization, seems to be up for grabs. And so I'd like to talk a bit about that and, uh, and see how we might think about uh, looking at all of those different systems and how we might design them. So to move on, um, I'll start with a, um, with a summary of, the, of what I'm about to say. Um, you'll see in a few moments that designers around the world, whether you call them formally designers are just inventors, uh, but they have reacted very quickly to the COVID-19 crisis. But I'm going to uh, uh, talk to you a bit about design in a much broader sense. It's much more about um, PPE, ventilators, and the kind of uh, quick things that people have done. It, it does deal and can deal with massive wicked problems such as the murder hornet or eventually COVID-19, etc., etc. And uh, the, the main point here is that through design thinking, we now have an opportunity, a unique opportunity to invent a future, to, uh, to design a new future that is designed around people and around communities. Um, so to move on, here's, this is a, a uh, quotation from uh, the Design Management Institute and it's the theme of my next few slides. Design thinking and co-creation isn't a fad but rather a new way for all problem solvers to put the user at the center of a problem rather than develop solutions from the, uh, to develop solutions from the outside in, that is looking outwards from the outside in towards an organization rather than an organization looking out at the world. That's called the inside out perspective. Um, 
I'm going to, many of you will know what design thinking is and will have very good ways of talking about it. Uh, for those of you who don't, I'm going to give you a super quick one slide introduction to it. On the left of that slide, you'll see design thinking represented as a process. And I see it as essentially three elements. That is framing a problem, that is deciding what is the right problem to solve and how might we actually frame it. And if you get the framing right, an awful lot else follows. So the framing is very much at the core of this. Empathizing with people, and that is really deeply understanding the people that you're dealing with, whether they be users or stakeholders, and making. Um, and that is actually rapidly prototyping things almost from the beginning of your, of your, of your uh, process. Now, you'll see three double-headed arrows there, meaning that you can, go, you can start anywhere in this process, you can go back and forth, you can go all around it. Uh, it is obviously greatly simplified. You'll see many processes that are nine, 10 stages and so on. But these are the common elements that you'll find in, in, in any design process, framing, empathizing and making. I would not be doing it justice if I were to say, right, well, if you just follow the framing, making, empathizing process, you're a design thinker. It really is much more than that. And, it's, and this is the subject of a book that I'm working on right now, is that it's, it's also a, a way of seeing things in the world. It's a mindset. And this uh, quote comes from a, a, an interview I did with the design firm IDEO early on in my development of this, of uh, design, or my discovery, I should say, of design thinking. Um, it's a way of approaching problems in the world that begins from a point of optimism, that there is a solution and it begins, and it's a matter of us reaching us. Uh, it builds on that with this idea of mind of a child with this ability to be open to whatever the world is going to tell you, and coupling that with this idea of an attitude of wisdom being able to recognize evidence for what it is and acting on it. And you'll see, um, you know, I've, you may accuse me of being a little too optimistic in this, uh, in this presentation, and I will take that on. I'll take responsibility for that. But optimism is fundamental in, in design. It's this idea that, uh, yes, somewhere there's a solution to this, and we have what it takes to, uh, uh, to, to, to uh, solve it. We can talk about that, uh, the theme of optimism in a little while, too, if you want to ask some questions around it. Um, this is uh, from uh, Muratowski uh, in 2015. The design today is no longer about designing objects, visuals, or spaces. It's about designing systems, strategies, and experiences. That's why design is now largely recognized as a vehicle for corporate innovation and accepted as an agent for social change. Um, that's important because that, that goes back to a tradition of thinking about design that's, you know, at least uh, 40, 50 years old now. And it's nicely expressed by a famous design uh, researcher called Richard Buchanan. And you'll see in this diagram at the bottom left, you see uh, communications and then the next level up from that is material objects. So communications, information design, graphic design, visuals, and material objects, things like products, industrial design, technology, and so on. But he also talks about, and this is very much when we talk about design thinking, we talk about these higher levels, what's sometimes called strategic design. So it's uh, activities, uh, organized services. So it's actually service design, UX interaction. Some of you will be in, in that business already. Process design, instructional design, the kind of thing we've been doing for the new MBA. And then the next level, uh, si designing systems and designing environments urban design, organization design, healthcare design, supply chain design. All, and it's on those systems that I want to focus a bit more as we uh, go through this presentation. To um, just summarize that fairly simply, are the, the bottom two, communications and materials, are what we think of as traditional ways of thinking about design as a craft. And that's where, you know, if you go out and talk to most people about design, they'll say, oh yeah, it's, you know, designing curtains or designing chairs or whatever. That, and that's a legitimate uh, territory for design. It always has been. But design of these higher order things, activities and services and systems and environments, really gets us into the realm of strategic design and ultimately design leadership. And again, at, at, towards the end of the presentation, I'll talk about what, what it is to be a, a design leader. Um, so uh, just to talk about what's been happening for the last uh, six weeks or so, or two months it is now, in the world of design. I'm, I'm calling it the great scramble because uh, there has just been a, a flood 
of inventions and that it's fantastic it's wonderful to see the creativity that's got uh, that has been born of the crisis and as i mentioned in the summary for this with necessity some other in of invention and yes lots of people are inventing so let me give you a a, a few of a few of them that, just to illustrate the point very early on this is in january um the johns hopkins developed a dashboard for uh covid 19 around the world uh, January 22nd, you'll see on the on the slide there. That very quickly became the authoritative uh, uh, graphic that everybody in the media went to and uh, many others besides in the healthcare uh, industry and so on. And you'll see there are other dashboards now that pretty much all been modeled on the on the Johns Hopkins one. Um, but that was a very quick piece of communication design. So it's very much at that that uh, that level. Um, then there's lots of product design. This was um, Dyson, actually, the people who make your vacuum cleaner. Um, very Within the space of 10 days, um, and with a, a personal investment by Sir James Dyson of, I believe it was 20 million pounds, um, and they designed a ventilator. Uh, they were actually, there's more to, the, more to it than this. Yeah, they, they, um, they were asked by the, the um, British government to design a ventilator. They succeeded in doing so in 10 days. And then the British government uh, said, actually, we don't quite need as many ventilators as we thought. So that was, uh, it was a bit unfortunate, but it is a whole new uh, business direction, if you like, for, for Dyson. And uh, it, what they did was incredibly commendable. Um, and then there's some other fun things. This is the, uh, actually I should, uh, uh, just make sure you can see this. Is this is the Stay the F Star 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 at Home Desk, uh, designed by Stika, and you'll see on the left there's that's it, and you'll see on the right it's actually a cardboard desk, so it comes packed flat and and die cut and folded, and within a few minutes you can uh, pop up your own desk. So another another piece of design ing ingenuity here. This is from um, TU Delft in the Netherlands, and what uh, this is actually a student project where over the past uh, few weeks, what they've done is de designed a platform for remote video entertainment and education for kids because they see the need that parents and kids are at home together and they need some activities, uh, preferably educational activities that they, they can do together. So on the, um, definitely, I mean, these are, as I said, these are very quick things that people have done. Um, some of them have taken tremendous resources as in the the Dyson one, and I, and I can rattle off you know, 20 more. Apple has been uh, designing PPE, for example. Um, there is an, there's, um, there was actually a competition. The, there was a design competition in Dubai that uh, yielded hundreds of designs, including a, 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 a locker uh, to go into healthcare facilities where a, a healthcare worker can put their clothes in and it actually sanitize and cleans their clothes while they're at work and then they go back and they put their clothes on to go home. So there's many, many creative designs happening, but that's only the thin end of the wedge. And so the bit that I think gets to be more interesting now is beyond the scramble. So beyond the great scramble, what, what has to change? And I'm going to argue that it's much more fundamental or it can be if we want it to be much more fundamental than uh, what has gone before. Um, it's worth taking a quote from um, a gentleman many of you will recognize, that's Andrew Cuomo. Um, and this is a couple of weeks ago as he was contemplating reopening New York, and still is. Um, but I, I was quite struck by what he said. He said, what have we learned? How do we improve and how do we build back better? Because it's not about return to yesterday. There is no return to yesterday in life. It's about moving forward. And so that's, the, that's uh, to me, quite significant because uh, there's a sense here that, you know, when we talk about reopen, we're not necessarily reopening the world as it was. We're reopening a new world, and that's what, something that's worth thinking about. Um, so if you think about returning to work, of course, for many of you, this is what you'll face, right? If it's, if it's the work as it was yesterday. But potentially work could be very different. And we're seeing that pattern um, starting to emerge, obviously, with the crisis. I would argue that it may well last beyond that. Uh, Steelcase, for example, is looking at um, redesigning the, the workplace of the future. And what they're, they're saying is, uh, in, in, a, in a blog that they posted a couple of weeks ago, people now have a new appreciation for being together and will want to feel a renewed sense of community. 
Virtual and physical experiences will bring people together in new ways to create a sense of belonging. So what they've done in this case is they've designed, this is kind of the, the isolation desk. So this would go into an office. And uh, as you can see with the glass panels, it keeps people uh, reasonably isolated from one another. But I think things are potentially more fundamental than that. Um, this maybe is the office of the future, right? Um, that it's uh, you with your hoodie and your cat in, at home. And the reason I'm not, I'm not just sort of sort of saying this for the sake of saying it. In fact, um, Leger and Leger in the past, uh, just about, again about two weeks ago, released a study in which they asked people uh, whether working at home was a, a positive experience. And here's what they answered. Um, and it was a, a four-point scale or a five-point scale really, but 79% uh, uh, of respondents said it was either very positive or somewhat positive against 20% who said it was negative. By the way, that's not to say that people thought it was easy because the following questions in the survey also ask, well, was it an experience or was it an easy experience or a difficult experience? And the majority shifted over and said it was difficult or it has been difficult. So um, it, even though you might have to deal with uh, kids who don't know what to do with themselves and, and all kinds of other things, People prefer working, generally prefer working at home. Now, I'm guessing that people won't want to be isolated in their homes, obviously, forever. But having the option of working at home is, is something that makes sense for, for people. It also makes sense for employers because uh, clearly they don't have to be as invested in, in real estate as they are now. So over time, I, I, I see an opportunity for the entire workplace and that big traffic jam to change because you'll see uh, some significant shifts in the way that people are, are, are working. Uh, but that's not the only system that's about to change. All of a sudden, your doctor makes house calls. Right? Uh, for, uh, I don't know about you, but my doctor until not long ago uh, was doing things by fax. Um, and all of a sudden, we're now seeing that, uh, the, you know, I was on a, a video call, a Skype call with my doctor last week. Uh, so many, many uh, my medical pr practitioners have begun to use uh, video appointments. And they're now being compensated for them, which is new. That there wasn't a code for compensating uh, doctors for video appointments. There is now. So, so there's a, a significant shift there. But it... Um, it does, does go further than that. Um, this is uh, an article from the, the New Yorker by Siddhartha Mukherjee. And I, I, the, it's, a, it's a great article and I'd recommend you read it if you, if you get a chance. Um, medicine isn't a doctor with a black, black bag after all. It's a complex web of systems and processes. So he goes on to talk about the uh, both the medical system, the research system, and the administrative system in medicine. So that it's the intertwining of these three systems. But here's the, the bit that I find quite interesting. As a physician and researcher, I fear that the resumption of normality would signal a failure to learn. Those are my italics. We need to think not about resumption, but about revision. And essentially, the, the argument in the article is that the health system is in something of a, was in a crisis before COVID. And now there's an opportunity to really redesign it by, by bringing it up to speed with current technology. Um, this then is of course about airlines and airlines are, are suffering badly. I listened to a podcast about uh, airlines just a few days ago and I had to, had to say it sounded to me from the airlines point of view quite optimistic. Um, but this, this is a, um, uh, a blog from, um, I believe this is uh, BCG, um, for business demand, we expect a relatively quick rebound in both short haul and long haul as business travelers be, try to reestablish their businesses. However, the level of rebound will depend on the state of the economy and any long-term structural impact of uh, remote working practices, again, my italics, which has yet to be determined and which will have to be assessed with consumer research. The reason I, I highlighted that in, in italics is that uh, it's pretty easy to envisage employers after all this is over um, saying, well, do you really need to travel across the world for that meeting? Now that we've actually discovered how to use these platforms that were always there, it's a lot cheaper and a lot more efficient to do not all, but a good deal 
of our, uh, of our business, our international business and our cross Canada business by Zoom or by Skype or whatever platform uh, we're using. So I personally, I'm, I'm much more pessimistic than the airline industry is about its future. Um, and the reason for that is that, that um, people are now discovering platforms that were always hidden in plain sight, but were not really widely used. And so we'll see that the impact of that last quite a long time. Um, so moving ahead then to some of the things that I, I think need to happen now. And it's worth just prefacing that a little bit by taking a, a quick look at what, it, at what a system uh, of uh, air travel would look like. And you'll see, I, I would say uh, on the left, you'll see I put in the word greatly simplified, simplified. and the, 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 the standard quotation that every system is des uh, perfectly designed to get the results it gets. So this is what it looks like if you want to go from A to B. There are several parties, there's local transport, sorry, there's, ex, you know, there's uh, online booking, there's local transportation, there is the airport, there are the baggage handlers within the airport, there are restaurants within the airport, you're now on the plane and there are, there are obviously the pilots, there's the administrative system of Air Canada, there is the financial system that supports airlines like Air Canada, there is insurance and all that supports that. There, is, there are all the video screens that you have in your plane and all that's associated with that. Uh, you get to the, your arrival airport, baggage handlers, local transport, and so on. As I said, greatly simplified. But if you look at these, look at these arrows, they're not just connected with one another, and I've left out a lot of the connections, but they also connect off to other systems. So they're hugely, <clears throat> hugely complex. And part of the reason we haven't made a great deal of progress in shifting systems for environmental reasons or for human reasons is that they are just so difficult and, and they are so intertwined. Um, interestingly, we all want innovation, but very often um, organizations haven't been able to, to tolerate innovation. This is a study from Deloitte, which uh, in which, and the, the, if you ask uh, future business leaders, they will say that innovation is absolutely necessary for business growth but only 20% of organizations actually encourage and reward creativity and new ideas. So it's actually very difficult in a lot of organizations for innovation to, 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 to be tolerated. Um, my, my former Dean, Roger Martin, used to talk about this as the distinction between reliability and validity. Reliability is the ability to replicate. It's the, uh, the ability to, to, to do things over and over again the same way to, to, to get the process perfected. Uh, validity is all about uh, the, uh, the importance of what you're doing. So why are you doing what you're doing? And so that these two, in the, if you think about those two in a business setting, then the reliability part is the, the churning out widgets over and over again to the same specifications. And then the, the, the other one is the actually thinking about, okay, well, why are we here? and Where can we go from here? Those two processes don't sit very well together in organizations. And it's, it can be very difficult to, um, uh, to, to make them sit well together. Um, often organizations stick with what they've done before. Though it may, this is again from Richard Buchanan, though it may seem counterintuitive, organizations are sometimes trapped by their own success. They're trapped in what's been successful in the past, but is no longer well suited to new circumstances of the marketplace or of society. Well, if we ever had new circumstances, we have them now. And, and so what is the opportunity here then? If it's uh, it, uh, beyond just sort of business as usual? Well, it's not doing what we've, what we've done before. Um, I just found the, uh, this uh, diagram or this design of a door quite funny when I found it online. Uh, fire exit only, please close this door quietly as guests may be sleeping. Um, and that's the product of, it is the product of design, right? Somebody somewhere uh, designed that door, designed the, the, the communication on that door, but evidently designed it without a whole lot of thought. Um, and so my point here is that everything in our world is designed. Um, our communications, our products, our services, our systems, but we don't often acknowledge or realize that we are designing it. And so what we're kind of doing a lot of the time is backing into design. We're not really thinking about it. Um, 
Richard Buchanan again saying, designers have the capacity to think before they make or do, something that everyone in organizations should keep in mind in their own work. So, so and that's the quality of, of design that I think is most interesting. It's this idea of using, if you like that, that framing, empathizing, making process to serve play with ideas, move them around, test them, see if they work, go back to them while staying open and optimistic all the, 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 the whole time. So that, that that thought process is absolutely central to design thinking. Um, and that then really, for me, gets to be fairly exciting because we now have an opportunity to put some thought into designs that have just carried on as legacies of the past. Um, Nesta, which is a, a foundation in the UK that uh, promotes a lot of design work, had a, a workshop or a seminar a few weeks ago called What Type of Country Do We Actually Want to Become? New Ways of Unlocking Public Imagination About the Future. So what Nesta is calling for is a series of conversations in the UK about what is the, what is the world we want, what is the country we want, and where are we going with it? Um, I hope you didn't, uh, as you tuned into this, hope you didn't expect to have answers to these, but I do have some, some questions I think we should be asking. We should be thinking about a design dialogue um, about what our futures are. And that is, uh, we should be, we now have discovered what uncertainty really is. We haven't died. Uh, we uh, and we can embrace it. We can get the best of uh, of our of our minds and hearts by embracing it, rather than trying to shut everything down and uh, and keep things predictable. So embracing our uh, uh, uncertainty, not running from it, broadening down the range of options and not narrowing them. I'm doing. I'm writing a, a book on design mindset right now. That one of the key tensions between designers and non-designers is that they designers tend to connect much more widely to things out there in the world. And when they uh, present some of these uh, you know, broader connections to other people, uh, they find that they tend to get funneled down into very, very narrow sets of options. Be human, don't be technocratic. These systems at the heart of the systems are, are there to improve the human condition and human flourishing. And so let's be human, let's keep humans at the center of everything we do. Uh, we tend to think in very, very narrow disciplinary silos. So we need to think across those silos and be much more integrated than we've been before. Um, visionary, uh, think about, as I mentioned, optimism, think optimistically, think about um, you know, what might be possible and, and not hallucinatory on the one side where you're thinking about uh, the things that just aren't possible or myopic, which is shutting down some of the, the, option, the options and optimistic, not pessimistic, as I said a few times. Um, there is some work also on leadership in design and Christian Basin, who ran the um, Danish government's mind lab uh, in, uh, in Copenhagen for many years, now is CEO of the Danish Design Center, has uh, a number of qualities of design leadership. One of those is to leverage empathy. In other words, to think in terms of people always. Are these the end users of the systems? Are they people who are stakeholders in the systems? Are they people within your own team? So using empathy. And when I say empathy, it sounds like a fuzzy word, but it's a, it's a word that in design has got some very concrete things that you do in order to develop it, such as user research, such as ethnographic uh, methods and observation and so on. So that there are ways of developing and feeding empathy that designers use. So leveraging empathy is the first quality. Second is um, navigating ambiguity. I mentioned earlier the idea of embracing uncertainty. So de designers are, are very comfortable in that place where nothing's quite resolved, there are a whole lot of possibilities and what we need to do is find ways through by using research, by using ingenuity and creativity. So taking a broad system perspective, what does this overall system look like? What's it connected to? Staying optimistic, staying curious. Uh, encouraging divergence. So encouraging people to, uh, to go out and think in very, very different ways, um, but also having diversity in your team which also brings about divergence, brings about different, different ideas, because you're not going to get new ideas from the same people. Right? So, so having diversity in your team, representing different perspectives that may sometimes feel a bit threatening. 
And then rehearsing new for new futures. So prototyping is integral to design. And this whole idea of trying something, being open to failure, in fact, embracing failure as a way of learning, and then moving on to the next, uh, to, to the next attempt and the, through iteration. So that, that, that's what design leadership would look like. Um, I'm going to finish up then um, by, uh, there's a lovely quote from um, uh, the Indian novelist uh, Arundhati Roy, and she wrote in the Financial Times last month the following, the, the pandemic she was referring to here. It's a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. So the, her point is that we, we don't have to go back to the legacy systems we, we had before. We have an opportunity now to rethink things uh, from a human-centered point of view. And uh, designers are very, very well positioned to, uh, to do that and design thinkers too. So I will stop there. I see there are a couple of questions. So I will I, I'll put these up here and I'm happy to take further questions. Uh, so Don is asking me, could you give an example of using more traditional research and design processes design, to design and launch a web-based financial services platform versus what important insights you may uncover in the design thinking process that would have been missed otherwise? Um, or for some other kind of product, but interesting to show what you may miss in traditional research process. Hope that makes sense. I'm not sure, I know Don that you answered this one or you asked this one some time ago, and I'm uh, hoping that uh, what, what you've seen in the presentation will partly answer that. But essentially, uh, I, I, I don't have a concrete example, but for, for a financial service, essentially what you would be doing is trying to understand where does that financial service fit in, um, in people's lives? How do they use financial services now? And, uh, you know, and what kind of pain points are there that they may not be aware of? Just as a point of information, all of the major banks now have very active design departments, uh, both for not just retail banking, but for uh, institutional banking as well. So it's very much putting people at the center of the, of the process. And if I think of one before the end of the webinar, I'll, I'll definitely get back to you. Uh, Vivek is asking, do you believe that changes, oops, uh, do you believe that changes such as work from home or telemedicine will stick post COVID, COVID or are these temporary changes in behavior? I honestly think, and I hope it's been clear from the presentation that the genie is out of the bottle on those. Um, certainly the, the um, as I mentioned, the, the Leger and Leger research that shows uh, how people prefer to work at home and the fact that it also is a cost savings for employers. I think those are very, very powerful indicators. Uh, telemedicine also, telemedicine has been around for a long time, of course, um, and people have now started to, 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 to find ways of using it. So I, I, I do think that that's, that's there too uh, for, for a long time. Celine, uh, how do you see educational on-campus systems transitioning to a digital world? I should say, and that's uh, uh, thank you for raising it, Celine, because I do not want to suggest that we're all of a sudden going to go digital and be in our condos and apartments uh, for, for the rest of our lives. There is a place for in-person contact, uh, not only in medicine, but in, in, in work and in education. So as we're thinking forward about our, um, our new MBA, we're, we're thinking about in-person classes as well as online uh, delivery. So, so those things actually can, can fit together and we're discovering it as we go. And uh, you know, some of that, as I said, is a design process where we uh, trial and error. Bill Archer, are there best practices to introduce design thinking when the corporate culture is risk averse and more engineering? Um, I would refer you to my book, Design Thinking at Work, which uh, talks about uh, some of the best practices there. Very briefly, um, the, the approach I would recommend is uh, trying something, um, try, trying to get some low hanging fruit, some easy successes, and then building stories around those. And easy successes in design can be quite easy to come by because all you need to do is flip to a, a user-centered uh, point of view and that can create a, a huge impact. 
Umberto, how do you apply uh, design and services within a, a GBS, where not all actors are on, in the same page of it, design thinking? What do you recommend doing? I'm not sure what you're meaning by GBS there. It's not Gustafs and Business School, I think. Um, but if I just take the general point where not all actors are on the same page, they think of design thinking as a bunch of different things. Um, I would abstract out to the essentials. Uh, so some of the things we've talked about here, embracing uncertainty, um, you know, having uh, being optimistic, being curious, et cetera. Those are the, the essentials. And no matter what you do, those are elements of, of design thinking. And if you're not doing that, you're not actually doing design thinking. Uh, Melanie, why has it been that some systems and sectors have been able to react more quickly and successfully, such as medicine, technology, versus justice systems and others? Um, I, I suspect it's just the sense of crisis at this point. Um, Medicine has adapted because it's had to. Uh, the justice system, the, the lead times are a bit slower and uh, they, they've managed to, to, to sort of struggle by uh, without really adapting so far. So in medicine, there's just been a sense of urgency that, that has been absent in some other things. But over time, as the word world becomes more uh, technologically adept, I, I expect those to follow. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, Carmen, uh, ideas on how to replicate the group learning and in-person knowledge building experiences when delivering virtually. I don't think you can absolutely replicate the group learning and in-person knowledge building experiences. You can partly do it. And uh, platforms like Zoom have got breakout rooms and polls and other tools that you can do to try to, to replicate it. Uh, I've used breakout rooms and been on the receiving end of breakout rooms, and I've actually found them very, very good. I think the point is with that educational technology to use it what is good, uh, to use it for what it's good for, and a lot of that is content delivery. If you want to 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 have um, in-person experiences, then you really have to be in a classroom, and ultimately, uh, I I believe we will be. Roman, do you have any suggestions about how to inject design thinking into traditional organization? I think I've kind of already answered that, and I'd also refer you to my book, uh, Design Thinking at Work, which talks about case studies of um, uh, design thinking in large organizations, and there are many, many good examples of it. Uh, BC government is one of them, um, the uh, Procter & Gamble, the Mayo Clinic, um, very large organizations, most large organizations in, in certainly who are dealing, that are dealing with consumers have some form of design uh, initiative going on right now. Holly, um, Holly, where can we begin to break down the polarity that permeates public thought and impedes system design? What are the biggest barriers to design thinking? Um, the biggest barriers to design thinking, I believe, are fear of uncertainty. Um, so I, it is difficult for people to, to visualize what might be possible or to, um, or to remain in a place of uncertainty with the faith and optimism that you are going to find your way out of it. And so working, and so the, the antidote to that, I believe, is storytelling. Uh, and so developing stories of how people have navigated through the uncertainty and try to build confidence that it can, that it can happen. That's a very quick answer to a, a long, uh, to, to a question that can be a lot longer. Linda, any tips on getting buy-in for design and innovation from corporate bosses during this crisis and capitalize on the crisis? So um, that's another interesting thing. As I was doing the research for my book, Design Thinking at Work, I found that um, no design thinking initiative that had survived any period of time, uh, sorry, this is a double negative, did not have executive support. So uh, the point is that uh, support from somebody in top leadership is essential as a starting point. However, the good news is that that doesn't have to last forever because what it does is essentially it gives you air cover so you can start building support at grassroots level within the organization. So I would urge you, so my tip is to find someone who might be sympathetic and get them to really go to bat for this and buy you six months a year till you can show what you can do. Inga. Um, how do you gain experience participating in design thinking processes? Can you think of internship opportunities? I can, and it depends on where you are. Um, so I, I will say overall, 
there is, uh, I'm constantly being approached by employers who are looking for uh, people who can work in things like service design and, uh, it, and particularly service design, that's the big one. So, um, so there is a, a shortage of skill in this. The service design network is worth checking out. There's a, there's a service design global, they're based in Cologne, and there's also a Canadian service design network. There's one in the US as well, depending on where you are. So that might be a place to start, um, but many governments have, have design departments and I'd look for postings uh, there too. Uh, Brittany, are there any res resources out there that demonstrate integration of design thinking as a mindset framework with other work approaches such as Agile and Lean. This is actually an emerging area of, of, of research and there's not much published on it. Um, I, can, um, I, I can give you a quick answer to it. Um, the uh, Agile is, is, has a lot of similarities to, to design thinking. It has this iterative process and trial and error and prototyping. What it does though mostly is take a, um, a given problem and then use these processes to solve it. So design is very much about questioning the problem itself, questioning the premises. Uh, and that I would uh, argue is a difference from lean as well. Um, okay, uh, Kimball, as we learn from our current COVID-19 uh, experience and we're adapting to various changes in our life, I see design to be an important tool to create innovation. As per your chart, people are liking working at home but this is at, an early, at early stages of this experience. Companies will be saving money if we continue down this model as employees will be working from home, but this may have an impact on their social life down the road. Great point. How does design balance finance, socialization, and the environment? That's a, it's a fabulous question, Kimball. And what I would say there, it, I mean, there, in the current environment, there are, there are forces favoring it and forces against it and and one of the you know one of the things that's going on here is that people don't have an awful lot of choice um, what I would be doing as a designer is taking this as a as a an ongoing effort so I've been monitoring talking to people as they're coming out now from their their enforced lockdowns and discovering uh, what it's like to be out in the world again and then seeing what's the appropriate mix and the appropriate balance for different employers in different situations. I'm gonna guess, uh, and I bet a lot on this, that it's not gonna be 100% at the office anymore. Uh, I'm also gonna to suggest to you that it probably isn't gonna be 100% at home, uh, but that the balance will shift more to a blend of working at home, working locally in, in uh, shared workspaces, for example, and, uh, and working at offices too. Um, me Melissa, how do you introduce design thinking into a small nonprofit organization that can't afford to have a design specific department or specialization? Great question, Melissa. Uh, you don't need to be a designer to be a design thinker. So you, it really is a question of, uh, there, are, there are a gazillion resources on, online uh, around what is design thinking? How do you build design methods and so on? And I would just start by the first thing is go out and talk to people. Go out and talk to the, your stakeholders, to your donors, to your users, to, your stake, uh, to, to other stakeholders, and then start systematically bringing those into the, the uh, innovations that you're bringing up. But uh, yeah, so that it, and in a small nonprofit, you can be nimble, so that you, and you don't need a ton of money to do it either. So it's a, it's a great question. Uh, Celine Waters, Celine, how might we help shift the fear of uncertainty mindset? Um, my sense of it is it, it really is about showing rather than telling. Um, so it is really, uh, to an extent, people will give you some runway, especially if you're a senior leader, they'll give you some runway and, and see what you do. But it's mostly about taking a small project uh, showing that something that was ambiguous to start with, you can find a lot of clarity for, uh, then uh, and then sort of building from there. So within you know three months, uh, in my own courses, every every time I teach them, people go through that journey. They they start with a, a fear of uncertainty, and then uh, in the reflections at the end of the uh, the course, I always see that they they have really moved away from that. So I think it's through experience is my, is my short answer to that. Holly, 
What do you suggest for industries that are primarily resilient, or, sorry, that are reliant on in-person contact, such as the per performing arts and uh, construction? Um, I think you're, yeah, um, there isn't really much in terms of virtual work that I can suggest for those. Um, that said, really the universal message about understanding your users and really uh, understand, uh, appreciating their lives and where your product and your projects fit within their lives is extremely, uh, is extremely important. So there, there are, there are going to be some sectors of the economy which will still um, appear to work in the same ways, but there is an opportunity certainly for them to, uh, to, to think about things differently. Naveen, what web design software is good for webinars? Um, <laughs> what Microsoft Office is, uh, is wise to know? PowerPoint, Word, and Excel is obvious. Uh, just in general, for most of us moving to be able to be managers running professional webinars, you know what? I'm not the best person to ask that. To be honest, I'm not a I'm not a webinar techie. Um, I hope this has been reasonably successful for you. Here we've used Zoom, we've used PowerPoint, and they're fairly simple tools. So hopefully they they, they they've worked well for you. Have you written about design leadership? Not yet, but my colleague Maura Quayle, who I know. At, was or is on uh, part of the audience has written a book called Design Leadership and it's great. So I'd, I'd uh, recommend it. V uh, Vivek, what are the typical roles uh, in a centralized design lab in an organization apart from a, a chief design officer? Um, they're not, uh, the, okay, so they're not necessarily hierarchical roles. They're not hierarchical at all. So they tend to be around the divisions in the business. So there'd be a digital, there, there might be somebody who's an expert in digital. Uh, if it's a service design, you would have people who are expert, who have experts, expertise in service design. By the way, uh, a lot of people practice service design without having much education in it because in North America, there aren't many service design uh, uh, educational programs. So um, in any case, yes, yeah, service design would be another, uh, product design, graphic design. So they'd be more centered around the types of design than, uh, than any kind of hierarchy. You would have a design leader and you might have a project manager. Those would be the other, the other uh, ways of organizing it. Umberto, uh, oh, global business services, thank you. Uh, evolution of a shared service center. Here in Mexico, we are currently using DT to co-design services with our user customers, but in many cases, they're not familiar with design thinking. Should I use a presentation of the concept at the beginning uh, of the workshop or separately, what do you suggest? I would suggest uh, doing the minimum presenting just to sort of orient them to what the, what the overall process is and where it's going. And then what I would do is take them method by method uh, so then you can you can go into a method, explain how it works, and explain what we're going to do. And as the activities proceed, it's again it's experiential learning. As the activities proceed, they will start to understand what what it is you're trying to get, and they they become much more instinctive that way. Um, it, it, like a, a lot of learning, it's it's about um, telling. Uh, it's about showing as opposed to uh, to telling. Um, how do you manage a workshop online? Again from Umberto. Um, yeah, Miro and the other alternative is Mural. Um, they can be a little complicated. As with all software, there's a there's a little bit of a, there's a bit of a learning curve. I use Miro myself, um, and I, uh, I I found it reasonably successful. Although uh, it means that everybody has to ramp up and spend time and learn about it. Uh, Alfira, do you know? any asset managers that are using service design to design investment products. Um, I would refer you to uh, the, um, the banks, the big banks. I know a few people at the big banks. Probably the best thing rather than throw out names here is if you'd like to shoot me an email, I'd be happy to, um, to answer that and connect you up with, uh, with some people. Um, we've reached the end of the questions and I realized that I didn't put my email on the slides. I'll put those, I know that uh, the slides will be available on the, um, uh, on the Gustafson website. So I'll put my, uh, my email on those slides so you can contact me directly. Um, and Bill has got another one. Do you have a source for the chart you shared work at home? Yes, um, I'll 
I'll, that is actually on the slide. So when you pick up the slides, you'll see the link there. Linda, thank you. I appreciate that. Great. Thanks, Bill. That looks like the end of the questions. Uh, so uh, thank you for attending. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Love to have your feedback. And uh, if you are, um, uh, yeah, the, and you can find me on LinkedIn very easily. And also here at the Gustafson School, DL Dunn at uvic.ca. But I, as I say, I'll put that up on the, uh, on the uh, final slides. Okay, well, take care, everybody. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you, and I'm sure we will be in touch.